Hello, this is Dr. Amin Marashi, retina specialist in Marashi Eye Clinic in Adipo, Syria. I am presenting the course of OCT for macular diseases. In the previous presentations, I discussed the vitromacular interface abnormalities. In this presentation, I will discuss clinical applications of OCT in diabetic macular edema. When studying the OCT cross-section of diabetic macular edema, vitromacular interface abnormalities should be called out. In cases presented with vitromacular interface abnormalities causing corrugation of inner retinal tissues due to focal attachments with increased macular thickening, then parsplenic vitrectomy is indicated. However, in cases presented with epiretinal membrane, but with intraretinal cystic changes and increased central macular thickness due to microaneurysmal leak, which is confirmed with fluorescein angiography, then intravitreal anti-VEGF or steroids are considered. However, if this treatment failed to improve macular edema, then parsplana vitrectomy is indicated. Diabetic macular edema that is not associated with vitromacular interface abnormalities, OCT utilized to show the location of the edema as for central diabetic macular edema, intravitreal anti vegf or steroids can be carried out. In contrast, non-central clinically significant macular edema is treated with focal or great laser. OCT can show biomarker that can predict the visual prognosis post-treatment. Therefore, in cases presented with disorganization of inner retinal layers or and ellipsoid zone disruption with or without external limiting membrane disruption, it will have a guarded visual prognosis. In contrast, the absence of the early mentioned biomarkers may predict better visual prognosis. OCT features in diabetic macular edema are increased retinal thickening, which may be associated with loss of foveal pit in some cases of central diabetic macular edema. A cystic formation can be empty or non-empty continent in a circular or oval shape. Hyperreflective foci, which usually don't cast any shadow. In contrast, hard exudate that appear as a hyperreflective mass in the outer retinal tissues and do cast a shadow. Cotton wool spots are located at the retinal nerve fiber layer level and may cast a shadow. Other features can be presented with diabetic macular edema is subretinal fluid. Diabetic macular edema can exhibit several patterns such as cystoid macular edema, which usually appears as increased retinal thickening with an oval or circular, circular uh, empty or and non-empty cystic changes with loss of foveal pit with or without subretinal fluids. Those type of edema usually respond well to steroids. On the other hand, diabetic macular edema may appear a sponge-like increased retinal thickening with empty and non-empty intraretinal uh, the cyst that appears oval or circular and can be combined with subretinal fluids. Those types of edema usually respond well to VEGF blockade agents. Sometimes, diabetic macular edema can be presented with diffuse thickening without presenting any intraretinal cysts and can be associated with uh, subretinal fluids. OCT can reveal vitromacular abnormalities such as epiretinal membrane and vitromacular traction, which may change treatment decision-making or reduce the efficacy of intravitreal medication. OCT is very sensitive in measuring macular thickening and locating the edema at the central or non-central location of diabetic macular edema is key for treatment decision making in which OCT can accurately depict the edema's location using tomography. In contrast, a topographical map can be misleading when it comes to determining the edema's exact location due to it being dependent on computer software and patient data. For example, in this case of diabetic macular edema, the topographical map shows non-central 
diabetic macular edema. In contrast, tomography of the same case shows increased retinal thickening with cystic formation involving the center of the macula in addition to ellipsoidal disruption and heart exudates. Thus, relying on topography alone may falsely give the impression of non-central diabetic macular edema and may lead to wrong treatment decisions. Here is another case where tomography shows non-central located macular edema with cystic changes and hard exudates. The topography shows signs of non-central clinically significant macular edema, where both the inner and outer subfields are affected but sparing the center of the fovea. Most of the edema is located in the outer subfields with size bigger than 1500 microns. Those reading of macular topography can help to determine the indication of laser treatment. In contrast, when the inner subfields are not involved or and the edema is less one th than 1500 microns, may indicate clinically non-significant non-central diabetic macular edema, which laser may not be recommended. Topography may help to follow up changes in subfields post treatment in patients with non central clinically significant macular edema, as topography will take the mean subfields changes in the edematous area. However, tomography may show not only thickness changes but structural changes as well. When the edema is centrally located, the topography can play a role in studying and demonstrating the efficacy of the treatment in color-coded manner. As shown in this example, uh, the patient had increased thickness of the central and inner subfields due to uh, central diabetic macular edema and post treatment the topography shows resolution of the edema and improvement of macular thickness in the center uh, row and inner subfields tomography on the other hand sh may show not only changes in macular thickness but may show structural changes for example this uh, OCT cross-sections are for the same patient shows increased central macular thickness with a mix of non-empty and empty cystic changes along with subretinal uh, fluids and hyperreflective foci. However, post-treatment cross-section shows resolution most of intraretinal cysts subretinal fluids and reduction of central macular thickness but with some non-central ellipsoid zone disruption. It is important to remember that the relation between the central macular thickness and visual acuity is modest as the other factor can, may contribute in reduction of vision such as disorganization of inner retinal layers with or without ellipsoid zone or an external limiting memory disruption along with the presence of hard exudates in the center or 1800 microns uh, uh, along with uh, ischemic maculopathy if confirmed with OCT angiography or, flu or fluorescein angiogram. For example, this patient has a mild increase in central macular thickness but the best corrected visual acuity is 2050. OCT is the gold standard to diagnose the association of diabetic macular edema with vitromacular abnormalities such as epiretinal membrane or and vitromacular traction. Epiretinal membrane appears as a hyperreflective band causing corrugation of inner retinal tissues in the form of pegs. In contrast, vitromacular traction appears as anterior posterior oblique traction. Both Epiretinal membrane and retinal macular traction may increase macular thickness and induce intraretinal cystic changes. When tractional elements cause the diabetic macular edema, the treatment of choice is surgical by performing parsplanar vitrectomy. It is important to rule out vascular elements that contribute uh, in inducing macular edema in uh, cases presented with vitromacular interface abnormalities by using fluorescein angiography to rule out leaking microaneurysms.
as in this case there is an epiretinal membrane that does not cause distortion or corrugation of inner tissue but there are intraretinal cystic changes in this case crossing angiography may reveal leaking microaneurysms both tractional and vascular elements induce some uh, types of uh, diabetic macular edema as treating the vascular element itself may only reduce edema partially while the rest of the edema may require surgical intervention by performing prosplanar vitrectomy Topography for the same patient shows serrated uh, borders in the area of tractions. In contrast, edema appears with smooth borders. OCT in diabetic macular edema can contain several biomarkers which can predict the underlying pathogenesis and prognosis. Such as hyperreflective foci are signs of uh, the active inflammatory process due to activated microglia. When they surround the cyst wall, it forms pearl necklace sign, which may indicate a chronic diffuse leakage. Other important biomarkers are the disorganization of inner retinal layers, which may predict guarded visual prognosis every 299 microns of disorganization for more than four months will lead to one line loss of the final visual acuity the other independent biomarkers that may affect visual prognosis are disruption of the external limiting membrane or and ellipsoidosome in cases presented with a central external limiting membrane or and ellipsoidosome disruption end up with the visual prognosis regardless of the inner retinal layer status please see the difference in the organization of inner and outer retinal layers between two halves of this cross section OCT can be handy in revealing complications of the proliferative diabetic retinopathy at the posterior pole. This includes vitreous hemorrhage, which appears as hyperreflective dots, and preretinal hemorrhage appears hyperreflective with a smooth borders casting shadow. OCT is useful in these cases as it will rule out diabetic macular edema, which may impact treatment and follow-up decision-making. OCT, on the other hand, can reveal the presence of fibrovascular proliferation, which appears hyperreflective, uh, anchored within taut posterior cortical vitreous. And OCT can reveal if it is associated with vitreous hemorrhage, epiretinal membrane, macular distortion, uh, edema or schizes. Thank you for listening. I hope you find this information useful in your daily clinical practice. Please stay tuned to the next presentation where I will discuss about the clinical application of OCT in vascular in non-diabetic retinal diseases.